I think to me, the orientation point is not that I need to eat this today because I'm being chased by, you know, German soldiers, but I need to eat this today because I want to feel good when I'm 85 years old and still mountain climbing. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. So last week, we talked to Ted Gilletta, and he shared his inspirational journey of initially fleeing Ethiopia during a 1970s civil war to becoming one of the world's best masters runners, and recently he became a political figurehead. That's quite a story right there. So today, if you've been a long-time listener, you probably have heard my interview with one of the best-known running influences in the world. So Chris McDougall is who I have on the show today. So if I listened to that previous episode, which I did to make sure I did not ask the same questions, I cringe because it, I just sound so robotic and I, I apologize. I did get a lot of comments about that at the time, but I guess at the time I didn't understand what that meant. So either way, it was a fun conversation and he was just so easy to talk to. At the time, he actually said to me that we would do this again and I thought he was kind of bluffing, but he actually did say that he was interested to it and this time it was even better. We talked about what he's been up to, why all of us should consider parkour. Yes, I am also talking to the Masters runners out there. Why we should use fat for fuel and what his next book is going to be on. You are going to love that one. This episode is really conversational, so I'm really hoping you enjoy seeing a glimpse into his world. So right after we hear a word from our sponsor, we will get to the interview. Multiple studies have proven running with music helps to improve performance. I have become addicted to my Jabra Pulse Sport headphones, using them for almost every easy run, but shh, don't tell my coach. You will love these earbuds too, and you can enter to win a free set every month by visiting jabra.com forward slash runners connect. Welcome back to the Run to the Top podcast, Chris. Oh, I'm so glad we can do this. I'm so glad you wanted to do this. And uh, (laughs) I thought maybe last time you were just bluffing, but uh, I'm glad to hear that you actually have followed through and we are able to chat. (laughs) Me me too. Me too. Now the real hard questions are going to come in. Yeah, I know. I've been been preparing for this for a year, thinking about what I'm going to ask you. I've dug into your deep, dark secrets. I noticed you said these two big guys with baseball bats are standing behind me, so you'll get the honest answers. (laughs) Yeah, that I sent them. Um, So then speaking of like, yeah, it was just over a year ago that we last talked. So if you, I want to kind of hear what you've been up to. Um, I know that you did actually wish me luck for both of my marathons, which went well. So I've decided that you are my good luck charm. I am Mr. Fairy Dust. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, and actually for the listeners, I did actually email Chris before my marathon saying, can you wish me luck again? Because last time you wished me luck and it worked. Um, and it did. I, I got to I gotta capitalize on this. I got to do online yeah. good luck wishing services. <laughs> Start charging. Depending yeah, on yeah. every minute sort of a PR someone gets, you get like <laughs> right, right. $100. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, enough about me. Tell me what you've been up to. I'll tell you what I'm, I'm about to get up to that I'm kind of excited about. Mm-hmm. This weekend is the Born to Run Ultra Marathon Festival in California. Mm. And... Uh, it's a pretty wild thing. So Louis Escobar, the photographer who did all those great shots down the Copper Canyon for the, the race we did for Born to Run, mm-hmm. he started this thing, and it's become kind of like the Woodstock of trail running. He has this access to this giant ranch out in Los Olivos, California. And there's like a tattoo guy there. There's bands and people serving tequila shots and all kinds of different like gear and paraphernalia and apparel trading going on, like mm. horse trading. People are trading a buff for a t-shirt. Uh, everyone camps out. There's like fires and music and drinking going on and races, which range from 200 miles down to zero miles. They have a 0.0 kilometer race where oh, everyone goes to the starting line. Yeah. And then just turn around and go have a beer. <laughs> also one of the years, uh, I think it might've been last year, the world record was set there. The world record for the beer half marathon. Oh. Patrick Sweeney ran 13 miles and drank 13 beers. So you drink, you do you run a mile, drink a beer, run a mile, or is it oh, you oh, do oh, it at one go? Oh, well, I guess 
<laughs> choose your poison, right? Like, <laughs> okay. You want to die? You want to die by a, a dagger or or a bullet? Uh, no, you run a mile, drink a beer, run a mile. Oh drink my! Ugh, oh, can't even imagine. <laughs> I, I can't even. You know, they're 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 doing a um, beer mile rundown. I I can't even mm-hmm. imagine doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, four four quarters and four beers is too much for me. Yeah, well, that is impressive. Thirteen beers and a half marathon. I mean, good <laughs> on so- him. Yeah, it's something. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, I didn't even realize that was a thing. I knew beer miles were, were a thing, but I mean, that must, that means there's only a matter of time before there's a marathon turning up. So I don't even want to imagine. That. I couldn't even stand there and watch it and drink 13 beers. <laughs> Did he throw up? I don't know, and I mm-hmm. believe you cannot throw up. I'm not sure what mm-hmm. the elapsed time is after you finish before you're allowed to throw up, but you certainly are not allowed to, to vomit during the actual half marathon. Mm-hmm. That is immediate disqualification. Mm-hmm. Inter- so interesting. He kept, he, he kept 13 in his belly at least till he crossed the finish line. <laughs> well, good on him, and hopefully there's <laughs> there's another something interesting or unique like that going on. And actually, yeah. by the time this airs, um, that will have happened. So I, I, oh, I'll I tell to people some- to go check it out and consider it for next year. Well, I got to tell you something else too. So Arnulfo mm-hmm. Kimare, the guy who uh, had that big showdown with Scott Jorick and Born to Run, mm-hmm. he's coming, and he's also bringing his 16 year old son. So now mm-hmm. there's a whole new generation of Tatamata champions who are Ooh. stepping to the line. Yeah, I saw a, f- a photo actually of uh, that you put up on your Facebook page of uh, them having having lunch in, at the Boston Marathon. So can you kind of tell us what was going on for that? Was it just like a catch up or? You know, life, life mm-hmm. is so weird. And I remember mm-hmm. thinking at the time, man, life is so effing weird. Mm-hmm. That What happened was um, Professor Lieberman, the Harvard biologist yep, that we know I talked about, so he put together a Native American running conference uh, for the Boston Marathon. This was looking at guys like Tarzan Brown, who have been the great performers of the Boston Marathon over the past 100 years. So he was able to get Arnulfo Kimare and a female Taramara runner, Irma, to come up. And they were escorted up by the guy named Mickey Mahaffey. So it's it kind of amazing. Uh, they were, Mickey Mahaffey was able to uh, guide and escort Irma and Arnulfo out of the Copper Canyons all the way up to Harvard Square. Wow. And so I was going to be uh, meeting Scott Jorick and his wife Jenny in Cambridge for lunch. And I got a phone call out of the blue from Dan Lieberman saying, hey, uh, Irma and Arnulfo just arrived. I said, well, I'm about to meet Scott and Jenny. So he picked a restaurant and I walk in and, and just this, the most bizarre possible <laughs> union. Like, here's Scott. The last time I saw Arnulfo, it was 10 years ago at the bottom of a canyon on this like, dusty little one-street town. And now suddenly he's in Harvard Square with Dan Lieberman and Scott Yorick, and we're all sitting around eating some wacky like you know, vegan sprout burgers. Is that the first time they'd seen each other as well? Uh, the first time since the Copper Canyon. Scott returned a year later to race on Nufo again. Mm. So he saw him again in 2007. Wow. And that was it. Hasn't seen him in, you know, in 10 years. Yeah, I bet that was awesome to be a part of. And I'd love to have been a fly on the wall for the, the conversations going on there. And um, yeah, that's that's amazing. And, and just yeah. goes to show, you know, how we can travel around. I mean, not just us, but, you know, uh, s- someone from the Terra Humera, like imagining them coming to Boston is just amazing. So, wow, that's, that's so yeah. cool. And then, you know, I ran Boston on that, that Monday and um, just by luck, you know, in a sea of 30,000 people, all of a sudden I find myself right next to Irma, mm-hmm. the Taramara woman runner. And she was just the life of the party, just smiling yeah. and high five everybody. I mean, I think she's the only runner who actually high five every single person on oh, both really? sides. Yeah, oh, that's she awesome. A, she was a trip, yeah. And and you didn't plan to run near her? That just happened? Yeah, it just happened. You know, oh, again, crazy. it's just one of those bizarre things that happens sometimes in those massive runs. You look over and someone you wanted to see is, is just right there. Hmm. Wow, that's that's awesome. And how did you get on at Boston? Oh, I, I had a, I had an epic race. Uh, epic in, in both the, the good and the bad sense. <laughs> uh, I was actually helping friends, my, my old college roommate. The reason we were doing it was because he really wanted to do it. And I was... I'm not a big fan of big urban marathons at all, mm-hmm. but I did it um, for the sake of my friend. So I was kind of like player coaching him and his buddy through the run and telling him exactly what to do. Then all of a sudden, my groin and right quad just like blew up at mile 20. It just seized up so badly that mm-hmm. people thought I was having a heart attack. Uh, I was just like doubled oh. over and uh, going to the medical tent. And I, th- I thought I was done. 
They made me eat a dry bouillon cube, which, which, which I think is their way of getting you the hell out of the medical tent. Like, hey, eat this. Get out of here. And yeah, okay, then, uh, okay, I'll go. I'll, you got me. I don't think any more crap. So then, uh, yeah, I just basically hobbled and limped my way along to the finish line after that. But, you know, you're about 20. You're going to get there, but it just mm-hmm. seemed... Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure it felt like forever. So I have to yeah. ask, when you're running along, do, do most people recognize you? Is it like, hey, I know who that is, or is it... No, for the most uh, part, people don't, don't know who you are. Yeah, exactly that. Hmm. Um, but what was kind of cool was one guy came up behind me and he slaps me on the back. And this is a hell of a slap. This guy was enormous. Guy looked like a, an offensive, you know, football offensive lineman, which he had been. And he came up behind me and said, "Hey, man, thanks a lot because people always told me guys my size shouldn't run." But <laughs> and then I read your book and I thought, you know, I can do this. And he's actually quoting stuff from the book that I didn't even remember was in the book. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you know this book better than I do. So I had a little um, stick-on tattoo. I had a Born to Run yeah, stick-on that, yeah. tattoo. And so I said, let's do this, man. Let's do a mid-race tattoo application. So <laughs> along the sideline, some woman stopped with her family, and they were just handing her a bottle of water. And we ran over, and this guy grabs the bottle of water out of her hand. She's about to sip it. He yanks it out of her hand, soaks down his arm, and I take the stick-on tattoo and soak that down as well. And then we're jogging along. And I'm like holding this thing squeezed to his arm as we're jogging along. Unfortunately, he was so covered in sunscreen that only like oh, one little no. toe stuck. <laughs> so he <laughs> ran off with this, this one little toe. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But, and were you just carrying uh, some of them with you, the tattoos? Yeah, what I did was... <laughs> You're just sticking them on people when they're not looking. <laughs> almost, almost that badly. Like in the uh, porta potty line, you know, you got like 30 people waiting in the line. I just went down the line, just tattooed every single person in every oh, porta funny. potty line. Too. Huh. The reason I did it was because there's this great new company that I really like. And this is not a commercial um, promotion. This is purely a love of good people mm-hmm. doing good things promotion. Have you heard of this company called Janji? J-A-N-J-I. Yes, yes okay. they are doing good things. Yeah, so I was, I was psyched about Janji. I um, came across them by accident, and I read up on them, and I figured, you know, I'll, I'll order a pair of shorts, check these guys out. Loved the shorts, got another pair, loved those, got some for my wife, got some for my friend. And then in one of the packages, the Janji guys kind of finally figured out who it was that was ordering all this stuff. So they sent me a personal note saying, hey, man, we like, really like your book. If you're ever in Boston, stop in. So I set up with them to do a little tattoo parlor, like a mm-hmm. finish line tattoo parlor at the Janji store. Because they had a pop-up store right near the finish line. And I said, anybody wants to stop in and get a free Born to Run tattoo? So I had designed these tattoos years ago. Yeah, they're so really I, cool. I worked up another, another, another bunch of them and uh, just went to the JNG store. With our Nulfo came along, too. Mm-hmm. And we just slapped tattoos on every person. Then we went down to the Lennox bar and just tattooed everybody, everybody in the bar. So there were a ton of uh, drunk and happy people walking around. <laughs> and what about if someone wants one now? Can they order one online? Is it on the website or on the Janji no, website? No, it is oh, purely... It one is of purely, a kind. Um, well, I'm bringing a bunch, a bunch of them out to the Born to Run Ultra Festival this weekend. Mm-hmm. And also going to get a permanent version of the same one on my own arm. Ooh. I've already warned my wife, I am coming home with ink this time. <laughs> she does know that, right? It's not going to be a surprise. She does know. I mean, <laughs> you show up at a Born to Run Ultra Festival, you've got a Born to Run Ultra tattoo design, mm-hmm. and there's a tattoo guy at the finish line. Like, how do you avoid getting that done? And you are Christopher McDougall. You can't really, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got to walk, walk the walk, right? <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so, okay. So, speaking of the other book, um, Natural Born Heroes, um, when I talked to you last, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I actually called it a bestseller and you said it wasn't yet a bestseller, um, but actually it is now a bestseller. So I did predict a future with that. But do you want to, uh, you don't have to thank me, but can you tell us how it's been going with that? I'm digging this magic we have going back know, and forth. Okay, every book cycle, I'll contact you. Okay. Every marathon, you contact me. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm <have> cool. Deal. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but you, and there, there so, was a question. In there, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I was just saying, how do, how has it been going? How did how did Natural Born Hero sell? How's it? You know, how's the momentum been with that? It's good. We had a, a great great book tour. Um, one thing I learned from Born to Run is that it's kind of nonsensical to be standing in a bookstore talking about running to runners. So why are you standing around sitting on your butts when you should be actually doing the thing? Mm-hmm. So what we did for the Born to Run tour was have like these fun runs built in. And then I would grab whoever I could get to come with me on tour. So like Scott Jork or Eric Orton. 
um, w- w- Barefoot Ted. So we do these events, where, or Dan Lieberman often, where I would bring in some of the people from the book. And mm-hmm. then people could actually hear from the actual people what they have to say rather than me paraphrasing. So we did the same thing with Natural Born Heroes. We had this insane uh, book tour going on, which was like a moving carnival. It was me, uh, Liz Mealy. Did you, did you talk to yeah, Liz Mealy? Yep, okay. I did interview her and actually met her in Louisville. So. Isn't she the best? Yeah, she's awesome. Really, the really best. awesome. Yeah. yeah, so it was me, Liz, uh, Dan Edwards, who's a parkour guy, a um, uh, woman who does a thing called Wild Fitness was along, Julie Angel, who also does parkour. Um, so, and what we would do is just basically rotate people on and off stage. So, everything that was in the book, you could actually see on oh, stage. Cool. And then we did parkour workshops and fun runs. So, mm-hmm. that went on. I think we did like 50 events. We were all over the place. Yeah. Awesome. So, that was, yeah. Although then, you didn't make it to Kentucky, which I did ask you about last year. So, Got how. close though. Got close. <laughs> We're heading up Alabama uh, to, north toward um, Detroit, but we had to skip over those those middle states. Mm. Hey, but I might be coming through. I am coming through Kentucky, hmm. um, driving to the Western Packboro Racing World Championship okay. in July. Are you home in July? I will be for most of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll have to set that up. Make sure. And anyone listening, if you're in Kentucky, you'll be. You'll be uh, looking out on the roads for someone, someone coming through. <laughs> with, a, with a trailer with three donkeys in the back. <laughs> three donkeys. I did see, I will have to put a link to it in the show notes. Um, there was a picture you put up on your Twitter, I think, or maybe you emailed it to me, I can't remember, of you with, I want to say it was a donkey, a goat, and one other animal, but it was one of the best photos I've ever seen. It was like a <laughs> selfie. It was pretty oh, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> oh, there's one of the donkey with the little kitten next to it. Too. Yeah, that might have been it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll put, I have to put a link to that. Um, yeah. So then, yeah, so things have been going well with the book tour. And um, yeah. I'm guessing the movie is coming along pretty well for Born to Run by now. Yeah, I'll tell you, this is, this is sort of breaking news that you're getting. This, um, so where things stand as of literally this minute is um, this week, they're trying to, they've got to lock in either the director or McConaughey. And so they have a whole list of like A-list directors that they're talking to. And Matthew McConaughey, who's already committed to play um, Camayo Blanco, but he's in the middle of filming um, Dark Castle right now. So Mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out his schedule and whether they can actually make it work. But they want to start filming next January. So like literally this, this week, if McConaughey's schedule won't accommodate next January, then they're going to immediately shift, get the director on board and start casting. So um, it looks wow. like by next January, we could be roll cameras. Very exciting. That's so yeah. cool. Oh, that yeah. must be such a thrill for you thinking about this, like actually coming to life. It's, it's awesome. You know, I, I, it, it sort of really isn't to be honest. No? Hmm. And I, I'm more intrigued by it because I am, like bewildered and, and sort of mystified like how ineptly Hollywood functions, like to have like a, a front row seat at, at all the goofiness that goes on there has been entertaining. But mm-hmm. the thing about it is um, I, I'm more of a book guy in general mm-hmm. and it's like movies come and go. Like, can you name a great movie you saw two weeks ago? Probably not. You know, you see yeah. a great movie and like two days later you, you've forgotten it. And a, a couple stand out in your mind that you love forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of them, you know, they come and go, they come and go. And so for me, books are everlasting. They're on your shelf. So I don't know, to me, this is not pride. I just feel like born to run already created itself. It already exists in the world. Yeah, yeah. And so film will come out, be kind of fun, be, you know, exciting for like a week or two and then gone, forgotten. Mm -hmm. No, I I can see that. That makes sense. I'd never thought of it that way, but that, that makes a lot of sense actually. So Hmm. very cool. Um, okay, so something that I know you are excited about, well, as you sent me a video and you've mentioned it a few times uh, so far, is uh, parkour. So yeah. you sent me this really cool video, and I will put a link to it in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc110. Um, but yeah, so you sent me this video, and um, you know that's obviously getting your excitement, but thinking, why should other people, well, firstly, maybe what is... It's so exciting about parkour and why should runners kind of care about it? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing about running. Let's, let's be honest about it. What we do as runners mm-hmm. is very, is very unnatural. You know, mm-hmm. what you do in a marathon, it really yeah. serves no natural evolutionary purpose whatsoever. No. I mean, it is, it is an insane proposition to say, I'm going to go out 
on a hot day and mm-hmm. run as fast as I can mm-hmm. for 26 miles. Mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty sure that never in human history was that ever required for any natural purpose. What about the original marathon? Wasn't that the whole reason behind it? Uh, well, do you mean the one like the whole Philippides, you know, yeah, battle yeah. marathon thing? Okay, yeah. But the thing about that kind of running is it's all surge and recover. I'm sure Philippides, and he actually ran 152 because he actually ran from marathon to Sparta mm. to ask the Spartans for help. Spartans were in the middle of a religious festival and said, oh, look, you know, it's Saturday. We'll be there Monday. Maybe next week. <laughs> yeah, maybe next week. We'll get back to us on that. <laughs> and then he ran back again. So he did like 300 miles round trip um, and then engaged in the battle. But, you know, what you find with anybody, even like the Tarahumara who run long distances, they're not blazing out doing mm-hmm. like, you know, regular splits. It's all, it's really, uh, you know, this guy gets a lot of flack, but the guy who really figured it out is Jeff Galloway. You know, this, the idea of gallow walking, like, that is pure, natural, human adapted running mm-hmm. style. Where you mm-hmm. go hard, you back off and recover. And you, kind of like you know a child, yourself. yeah. Yeah. And you know yourself too. It's like amazing how quickly you recover if you just give yourself yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing about parkour. I believe that parkour is a much more natural expression of what humans really uh, have evolved to do. It's really mm-hmm. what our bodies are best at. So what we've done is we've taken this whole range of activities and motions that our bodies are capable of, and then as runners or as swimmers or even triathletes, we've we've picked out one or two that we choose to do and ignore the rest. So you know, humans are really good at throwing and climbing and crawling mm. and vaulting, all these things. We just choose. We'll just choose one. We'll just choose the running one, and we'll just ignore everything else. So, you know, another name for parkour is free running. The yep. idea is rather than just go in a straight line from point A to point B, that you actually zigzag across a landscape and challenge yourself to use the full range of motion. Mm-hmm. Of your body. So I asked about that video. So you saw Movement of Tree? Yeah, yeah. And, and I definitely encourage everyone to go check that out because it, it's just fascinating. Like you, I was like entranced in it just watching. And yeah, you're right. It is just natural movements and just... It was just, I don't know, I was very jealous because I, oh, maybe I could, but I feel like, wow, I could never do that. But it's just, yeah, it's just fun to see them, you know, exploring the tree in all kinds of different ways. Yeah, and that's actually what the filmmaker, so the filmmaker who did that is named Julie Angel, mm-hmm. and she'd be a great person for you to speak with. Uh, she did another one called Movement of Three, and which is three women doing similar stuff, but in an urban setting. And, you know, Julie's goal is to remind everybody that this is accessible to any single any single person what's cool about movement of tree is you know it's, it's all kinds of different women like what i really dig about it mm-hmm. is like you never know which kind of body is going to come flying in the frame you know they're mm-hmm. big and small and some are heavier some are thinner um and they're all women and the thing about it is that after about 10 seconds you forget you're watching women you're just watching yeah. these cool cool athletes yeah and that's, that's julie's point about parkour is it's one of those sports where the differences between men and women are pretty negligible. Uh, that when you do an activity that humans naturally evolved to do, then it's pretty accessible to all humans, you know, mm-hmm. regardless of age or gender. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that you just mentioned that, so that was actually something that came to my mind when you first, uh, you know, started talking about it. Is is what about age? So a lot of our listeners are masters runners, and they're probably thinking, well, you know, I can't do that. I'm going to put something out or hurt myself. So. Anything you'd like to say to Masters Runners listening? Yeah, if you don't do that, then you're guaranteed to put something out. You know, where <laughs> the injuries come from, as you know, it's locking into the groove yeah. where you're just doing the same with motion. Yeah. Totally. And think about parkour. I, I can go on about parkour for a long time because I mm-hmm. feel it, it, is, it is really like the ultimate sport. It's exactly what every person should be doing all the time. So for starters with parkour, is it's non-competitive. There are no parkour championships. There are no parkour competitions. The whole uh, philosophy and protocol of parkour is to not beat anybody else yeah. ever. Yeah. And so when you go to a parkour class, it is all um, individually sort of stylized. So what you should do is you get together in a class, and there'll be very kind of loose, fun warm-ups in a group. Everyone's doing it together. And everyone's shake out their entire body from head to toe. Then you'll start on the first, uh, say, skill. And maybe the first skill that you're working on that day is a thing called a turn vault, where you're vaulting over a railing. So everyone will line up to do it. You just do as much as you can. If you can't get your butt over the railing, then you, you practice getting your butt as high as you can. And at some point, someone will walk over to you, 
adjust your technique and then over you go. Mm-hmm. And when, then once you get it, you practice that thing. But what's really cool about it is because you're working on a skill, you become very tunnel visioned into yourself and your own approach to that task. You don't really care. You don't even notice what anybody else is doing. Mm. And, and the skills themselves are very self-regulated. You're not jumping off of a rooftop. You're working on one simple thing like how to place your hands on a railing so you can vault over. You may practice just placing your hands for 15 minutes, but it's totally engrossing. You, you get totally absorbed in it, and you're not doing anything reckless at all. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would tell people what's going to happen is they're going to find their own range of motion just skyrocketing to become much more nimble and then much stronger all around. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, li- was going to say the, the women in that video, you know, you could see they were strong and they were powerful, but it wasn't in a like, you know, body bodybuilding kind of uh, unnatural way. It just, you could just tell they were just strong from actually just doing the activity, which was really cool to see. Yeah. Um, and then one other question that comes to my mind is, okay, what about the fear? So, you know, if I think about I'm upstairs now, if I, you know, went downstairs and I sat on the railing and slid, slid my way down and I fell off and hit my face on the floor, like how, what about the fear, <laughs> of, the fear of hurting yourself? Oh, that's a cool thing about parkour is that it is an antidote to fear. What happens is, again, you're not starting off with big reckless movements. What you're starting off with are um, learning fundamental skills. Mm-hmm. And so, and it's, so here's, here's the thing. Like one fundamental aspect of parkour are precision landings when you jump. So when you land, you want to land exactly where you want to land. So you're mm-hmm. not wobbling back and forth and needing to put a foot backwards. You know, like when a gymnast sticks to landing? Yeah, yep. So that's what you're practicing. Well, to practice that kind of thing, you don't have to jump out of a tree. You could just draw a line in the mm-hmm. dirt two feet in front of you and then practice landing exactly on that line silently in a deep squat without wobbling around. Mm-hmm. Now, the first time you try it, you, you're going to fail. You know, you'll miss the line or you'll need to put a foot back to steady yourself. And the next time you get a little bit better and a little bit better. And you think about it, the challenge of trying to jump two feet and land silently on that line, you get so wrapped up in it. It's like doing a Rubik's Cube, mm-hmm. you can't stop. Mm-hmm. And then once you've done it two feet away, then you work on three feet away. Yeah. And then maybe you jump onto a curb. So that's a very, like, it's a very simple, non threatening, non dangerous task. But when you try to do it, you have a blast. And then by the end of it, you realize that the only way you're able to stick that jump was by jumping high and then landing in a deep squat with your butt all the way down against the ground. You do that four five times in a row, your legs feel fantastic. So I would say fear is not an issue at all. And mm-hmm. when I've talked to parkour people, almost never have any of them ever gotten hurt. And it's not because that they're like cautious, it's just because you naturally progress to things that you know you can do. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, then one more thing you'll have to do is you'll have to apologize to my husband if I start leaping around the house and making a ton of noise because I'm uh, not very good at landing quietly. <laughs> 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 he might oh, be a bit confused. Well, maybe he'll be thanking me. Maybe you'll actually, you know, you'll get a little bit smoother. And yeah. Less, you know, yeah. Actually, less... my strength coach does make me do like plyos and a lot of yeah. it is jumping and trying to land quietly and like yeah. you said, landing in that deep squat. And actually, uh, that was something else I was going to ask you about is... Um, you know, we you talked in uh, Natural Born Heroes about, well, I think, I think maybe even in both books, you talked about uh, using your fascia when you're running and how, you know, it kind of gives you that free energy, which I'm guessing parkour is pretty much solely based on, you using that free energy. So you want to kind of talk a bit about that for someone who may not have kind of understood what that means? Yeah, fascia is a fascinating thing. I, you know, first became familiar with it when I heard about a guy named Tom Myers, who's a an anatomist and um, physical strength specialist. And he was talking about how in the early days when he was first doing dissections of human cadavers, the, you know, all the researchers would sort of cut through all that sort of filmy gunk in, underneath the skin mm-hmm. in order to get at the real interesting stuff underneath, which would be like the muscles and the ligaments and the tendons. And he thought, well, what is all this stuff? You know, maybe, so rather than cutting through it, let's cut alongside of it. So he would dissect cadavers where he basically would retain all of this sort of rubbery casing. And what he found is your entire body mm-hmm. from head to toe is covered in this very strong sort of tensile resistant um, rubber casing. And what he found is, you know, a lot of times, you know, we think that it's muscle power that moves us along. But most of the movements that are really the most powerful have nothing to do with muscle at mm-hmm. all. So, you know, take for instance, like, you know, throwing a ball. 
You know, so you watch the guys who come out in Major League Baseball. These are like big fat guys chewing tobacco, and yet they can throw a ball at 100 miles an hour. And the reason why is because it's not the muscles. It's basically stretching those tendons out and letting them slingshot yep. uh, the projectile. And I find it with running as well, and it's something I am working on now and still it had for a long time. I still feel like I don't quite have it right. And I think that Eric Gorton, who, you know, who's been coaching me now uh, since the Born to Run days, a lot of times he'll talk about not really the foot strike, but really coming down kind of hard, actually planting the foot hard. And the reason why is like when you actually plant the foot hard, uh, it comes back up again. Hmm. And so now when I run, you know, when he talks about, there's been a lot of talk about people shortening their strides and, and, and upping their cadence. And the way you up your cadence isn't by focusing on lifting the foot up, but actually by bringing it down. Yeah. And again, the opposite of what I always thought. I thought it was about lifting the foot up very quickly. And his point is, no, bring it down hard and it'll, it'll pop back up again. So um, it's one of the things I work on is trying to get all that rubbery, elastic power harnessed yep. for myself. But you, again, you mentioned parkour. It's a perfect example uh, that when you are landing and jumping and springing back into the next one, rather than stopping, just let one bounce jump into the next bounce. Yeah, yep. And actually, that's funny. You mentioned about you know uh, changing running form. That's actually uh, when I went to UVA Speed Clinic. Um, well, I've been there twice. I'm going to go again, actually, very soon. But... Um, the uh, specialist, Max Procopy, he was saying to me about how um, once I changed my cadence, I kind of got to the point where I was trying to muscle it. So I kind of yeah. became almost like Roadrunner, you know, in Looney Tunes, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. rather than actually like pushing off the ground. So we've been yeah. working on that lately. And uh, yeah, it, it makes a big difference if you are, you know, allowing your body to use the push off rather than just kind of, like you said, just kind of um, just going round and round and not actually like pushing off the ground. So. Interesting yeah. you mentioned it. Well, well it's funny because, you know, there's that, that that drill I wrote about called the 100 up. You know, it's a mm -hmm. drill back from the 1800s where essentially you're just running in place. But when you think about it, if you were running in place and you were trying to run as fast as you possibly could, like like stutter stepping as fast as you could, you would actually be stomping on the yeah, ground. Yeah, but, but your foot would be popping back up again. Yeah. And I have a feeling, you know, I'm not a running technique expert, so... This when I talk, I am basically just trying to understand and yeah. repeat what people have told me. But my feeling now is that if you focus on that part, you bring that foot down hard, mm -hmm. it'll pop back up again, and mm -hmm. that's going to give you both the higher cadence, the shorter stride, and let you get free uh, energetic recoil. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, you may not be you know uh, certified in it or have all these degrees and stuff, but you definitely know and work with some of the the best you know scientists and people in the world. So that's. Uh, you know, you, what you're saying, if they're telling you that, is is definitely something I would consider listening to. <laughs> I, I guess so. But again, I'm not LeBron James. I'm the guy in the stands <laughs> watching LeBron James. So really, I, I think I, I always want to make it clear to people, I don't know this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I, but I think about it a lot. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And thank you for sharing that. And then uh, you also are very interested in, let's kind of move on to diet, which is something that I kind of wanted oh, yeah. to ask you about. Um, because last year when you were talking about the two-week test and you were talking about using fat as fuel, I mean, I found it interesting, but I was kind of thinking, yeah, yeah, but I'm a you know, I'm a marathoner. I run 90 miles a week. I'm not doing, I can't do that. I need my carbs. I need my carbs. But um, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, I have been working with Tony Prazak um, since yeah. I interviewed her on the podcast. She kind of, uh, let's say, gave me a bit of a reality check with my life. And um, I've been working with her and she's kind of made me change over to increase my fats. And I wouldn't right. say I'm low carb, but I've definitely, um, I um, got rid of the starchy, stodgy carbs. And I'm instead having more, you know, wholesome sources and increase my fat and protein. And I, can't even describe how different I feel. So let's kind of dive into that a bit more now, now that I'm actually willing to kind of entertain <laughs> the idea. And even though I'm probably going to confuse people because a few weeks ago we had an interview with uh, Dr. Inigo San Milan, who talked about how carbs actually aren't bad for you, like the, you know, t traditional forms. Uh, but I'd love to hear your your thoughts a bit a bit deeper on, um, yeah, using fat as fuel. Sure. Well, maybe one... Thing which will demystify or, or clarify things for people is get away from the word carbs. You know, basically, let, let's call them all sugars. Mm -hmm. And some carbs are sugar, some are not. Mm -hmm. uh, broccoli, for instance, uh, is a carb, but it's not really a sugar. Mm -hmm. So um, tomatoes, it is a carb, but it's not really a sugar. 
And so what you're looking for are foods that are either higher or lower on the sugar scale. Beans, for instance, a lot of people think, oh, beans, it's like, it's like a protein. Beans are a sugar. Mm-hmm. I mean, beans are a high glycemic food. Um, Phil Moffatone, who I feel is probably the most consistently smart and credible um, voice on this issue. He's been doing it back since the 1980s when he was training Mark Allen and changing Mark Allen's diet. And what mm-hmm. does Mark Allen do? goes out and beats the crap out of the Ironman records. He set records that people couldn't break for 15 years. What Phil Moffatone says basically is you're looking for things which are going to jack your insulin levels or not jack them. And uh, I, I tried to lobby for him when I was uh, doing the two-week test. I sent an email saying, well, you know, uh, garbanzo beans, you know, hummus, it's, it's kind of in the middle, and you can make an argument. So I like to lobby in favor of hummus. And he's like, rule number one, no lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is, dude. So I think here's, here's, here's the clarification point, is some foods will raise your insulin levels and burn quickly in your system. Other foods won't do that. And the beauty of the two-week test is you get a chance to figure that out for yourself. And again, it's another thing I love about Moffatone. He's not giving you a diet. He's mm. not giving you a one-size-fits-all. What he's telling you is, look, for two weeks, 14 days, let's strip your eating down to the basics. Get rid of all the variables. Again, two weeks, then you reintroduce them one at a time. And if you notice a physical difference, then you know what the reaction is. Mm-hmm. So for the two-week test, you remove all of the fast burn foods. So like no rice, no pasta, no bagels, no ice cream, um, no, no beans. Do that just for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, have some hummus. As you know yourself, you'll immediately feel a response mm-hmm. or you won't. Mm-hmm. You know, if you eat the hummus, like, you know, I feel fine. Have another spoonful of hummus, hummus. Oh, now I feel kind of sleepy. And then you realize a little bit of hummus is not really going to affect your insulin levels at all. Yeah, And so now you can gauge it. Okay, I'll tell you what, I can eat some broccoli with some hummus on top, no problem. For somebody else, like myself, for instance, I, I know that I can eat like a piece of rye bread, no problem. I eat two pieces of bread in a sandwich, I immediately feel sluggish mm-hmm. and sleepy mm-hmm. and, and bloated. And so that's the beauty of the two-week test is you chuck out all of the mystery about this stuff and you figure out for yourself how your body reacts to certain foods. Yeah, yeah. And I, I didn't even do the two week test. I just I just, you know, took Tony's recommendations and started pulling things right. out and, and I did notice I had pasta um before I ran in the world half marathon championships, I, I had um pasta I think two nights before that and immediately after I ate it my stomach was just not happy. And so it just put me off having it and uh so I kind of moved my, my diet around for for racing and I've you know been happy with it since and we were talking in email a few days ago about um you know uh eating junky foods and how they make you feel and you know I'd always kind of thought to myself oh you know you can't really tell the difference when you have something bad like you know your stomach's going to get upset either way but um you know you you're right that it really you really can tell the difference once you start to give your body those those foods that work well with it and you know sit well with you and then you add in the things that don't you you kind of have to play a game of like sacrifices okay yes i want to eat that cheesecake but am i prepared to sit there feeling uncomfortable for a few hours and sometimes yes i mean for me i it's like sweets i i do like cake and you know if someone got me a cake then i'm gonna have a slice and it's it's worth it but it's picking your battles and i think that's something that was important to say. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that it is just two weeks. So if people want to try it, they can do it. And that's a realistic amount of time to do it for. Yeah. And I think that the, the important thing about it is, again, it's like rebooting your computer. It's like yeah. putting your computer back to like sort of factory install. You know, we, we eat stuff every two or three hours a day, every day. And we have no idea what the effect is on our body because, you know, if I, if I feel sick, well, is it, you know, the oatmeal I had for breakfast? Is it the muffin I had for a snack? Is it the Snickers bar I had for dessert? Mm-hmm. But you do the two-week test, and then you reintroduce these foods. Now you know. You know you know what the reaction is. And I, I fully agree with you. Um, what I like, too, is I'll look at a bowl of ice cream and go, okay, I'm going to eat that. I know what the consequences are, but I, I'm willing to accept those consequences. In the past, I wouldn't even be aware of it. You know, I, I wouldn't realize why is it that like, I, my head feels a little bit woozy. Mm-hmm. I might, must be sleepy. Mm-hmm. Now I know. No, it's my body reacting to the sugar in that ice cream. Like yeah. I said, sometimes it's, it's awesome and worth it. Other times, you know what? I think I'd rather get a good night's sleep rather than have my heart racing before I go to bed. <laughs> or I think I'd rather have a good run instead of feeling sluggish. Yeah, yeah. 
No, that's great. And thank you for clearing that up. So then just one thing that I was thinking about related to that is, um, you know, you kind of talked about um, in Natural Born Heroes about the diet that, um, you know, you lived off and how um, and how you well and the people that lived there uh, in Crete and things about what they ate and how, you know, they were in a place where they needed those calorically dense foods, you know, the high fat, the um, very easy to consume, easy to kind of get hold of foods, but we don't really live in a place where we need that nowadays. So what about people who are thinking like, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to give up those, um, those foods that I can eat quite a lot of because I don't want to ha- have like one spoon of, you know, coconut butter, which is 200 calories. I'd rather have other things. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, two things. One is I would chuck out the whole idea of sacrifice or, limitations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is one thing that Moffat Tone and Dr. Tim Noakes really stress as well, is that you can stuff yourself till you're sick, but given a choice between, look, do you want to stuff yourself with stuff that's really empty calories and garbage, or do you want to stuff yourself with something that's actually going to be really beneficial and make mm-hmm. you feel satisfied? So when I interviewed uh, Dr. Tim Noakes, he was describing the breakfast he had. And this is a guy who's like pushing 70. I mean, the breakfast he had would have like knocked me into a stupor as like a 25-year-old collegiate rower. You know, and this 70 year old professor is like stuffing in sausages and bacon and eggs. And I, I, forget, I think he had like a half a pound of bacon and sausage. <laughs> it was crazy. But he would feel so satisfied by that breakfast that he sometimes would not eat for 36 yeah. hours. Wow. Not because he was sacrificing, he just wasn't hungry. Mm-hmm. So that's the one thing you notice. And you've probably noticed this too, Tina, is that um, if I indulge in something like a, like a bagel with cream cheese, I will feel hungry like 40 minutes later. Yeah, cereal for me is especially. Right. <laughs> Eat some granola. And like suddenly, suddenly, it's not just craving. It's like you have a hunger pang. Mm-hmm. But if I throw down a wampum breakfast or like, you know, bacon, eggs, and sausage, I don't feel that same yeah. hunger. No, so, I do agree. I, so on, the, on one hand, I feel that when you change your diet to the um, low glycemic, the, the slow burn diet f- foods, you actually feel better. Mm-hmm. So you don't really feel like you're sacrificing. And the second thing is, you know, this, this idea that, well, you, you might need these foods in extreme circumstances, but you don't need them in your daily life. You know, but the thing about this is, you know, your, your body is this, this machine that has been fine-tuned to process certain things. So, like your car, you can put crappy gas in your car, but over time, you're going to pay the price for it. Mm-hmm. Your car is going to break down. And your body is the same way. You can get away with eating a lot of shit, you know? I mean, the human body can digest anything we're like we're like goats in that we can like eat tin cans and get away with it but after a while you're going to pay the price Mm -hmm. so i think to me the orientation point is not that i need to eat this today because i'm being chased by you know german soldiers but i need to eat this today because i want to feel good when i'm 85 years old and still mountain climbing yeah no that's great and and one thing i do want to say is you know um I'm sure some people are jumping to the thing of, well, yeah, but what about my cholesterol if I'm eating all these bacon and sausages and things? And I would encourage you to go listen to some stuff with, uh, with Ben Greenfield. And I'll put a link in the show notes about to, to his interview, but he talks about that in depth. Um, I know he's researched that a lot. And, you know, yes, your cholesterol may go up initially, but it, may, it will come back down. So, um, you know, I'm not an expert about this. I don't know if you are, but I know that Ben is definitely someone who does know and has researched a lot about that if someone is um, curious about it. Yeah, also look into anything that Tim, Tim Noakes has done. Yes, yeah, yeah, of course. Because likewise, uh, again, I'm, I'm also um, secondhand witness to this kind of stuff, not firsthand. But the operating assumption is that there is no correlation at all between mm-hmm. consuming saturated fats and, and cholesterol. Mm-hmm. And secondly, there's also very... Uh, doubtful science behind cholesterol and uh, and cardiac disease. Mm. So that, that's the whole question. Number one, is the bacon making your cholesterol go up? And number two, is cholesterol even a factor in cardiac mm-hmm. disease at all? Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Thanks. And uh, I just, so I just want to say one more thing to anyone listening who may be a little bit confused. You know, like I said, a few weeks ago, we did have someone who was talking, uh, Dr. Inigo was talking about, um, you know, eating the pasta and the bread and those things and it's not actually about that it's about you know exercise and then what we've been saying today is a little bit against that although in the same kind of way but um you know this is just chris and i talking about this and what's what's worked for us so obviously you have to try what works for you maybe try the two-week test if you don't feel that it helps you and you feel good then then don't do it 
or you could go you know in the middle where I went kind of easing things out and see how you feel so don't be scared I know it is overwhelming but um you know you've got to find out what works for you so just want yeah. to throw that out there so sure. um one other thing that I was just thinking about asking you about as summer is now you know quickly approaching us is um one thing you know we mentioned earlier about parkour and just how marathons run natural and how technically you know we kind of should be like kids or uh where we kind of sprint a bit and then rest and then sprint and you talked about in your book about um how uh the reason we were able to catch animals in the past in you know hunter gatherer days was by um not being like the animal and you said you know we're the best at sweating we're good at keeping keeping ourselves cool um and then so i just wanted to see if you had any any tips for running in this in this in the heat as the sum, summer is coming and that's the time when we sweat like and what are your thoughts this is a random one but what are your thoughts on like sunscreen does that block the sweat so we shouldn't use it or is it what's the balance there with with uh, <laughs> with um getting skin cancer <laughs> well, well this is interesting because this is where i definitely my personal tastes definitely influence my my opinions mm -hmm. so i'm not a fan of sunscreen yeah um and I justify it this way. Um, you know, one of the things that Tim Noakes has written a lot about has been hydration. Yeah. And there's been all these sort of scare stories. You know, you need to drink. Drink before you're thirsty. You got to drink so yeah. much. You know? Yeah. And he's like, that's crap. That's, you know, thirst is a fantastically useful impulse. You are thirsty for your, a reason. You know, for two million years, the human body has developed this mechanism which lets you know when it needs water. And it's called thirst. And so some dude who works for Gatorade is not going to outthink mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what Mother Nature has spent two million years developing. And I feel the same way about sunscreen. Uh, a sunburn is really useful. That If you're outside in the sun too long, your skin starts to hurt. Or you become aware that if I'm out too long, my skin's going to hurt. So I don't use sunscreen. I, I prefer like the natural reminder that things are becoming uncomfortable and I go in the shade. Hmm. I think we're, 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 people really get in trouble in our lifetime is this battle between what we should do and what we feel like doing. And so if your job lunch hour is noon, from noon to one o'clock, and that's when you like to run, it can be 105 degrees out there. You got to get your, you know, your hour running. So you're going to go out there regardless. Well, nature really doesn't want you to do that. Yeah. Nature true. thinks it's a bad idea. And yet you insist on doing it anyway. So that's where I think we run into trouble is insisting on, hey, my coach gave me this schedule. It calls for this run. So regardless of the heat, regardless of the temperature, I'm doing this run at this time of day. And so that's where I think we run into trouble is we, we refuse to adapt to the circumstances. Wow, that's really uh, cool. I'd never yeah. thought of it that way. <laughs> well, someone asked me this right before the Boston Marathon. And again, I, I, I never give out coaching advice or anything. So, it's, you know, and, and people keep confusing me with someone who actually knows something. <laughs> um, but I, I know people who know things. But my advice for the Boston Marathon was it was going to be a hot day. I said, tell you what, instead of thinking about your PR, why don't you think about helping somebody else out through the run? Like for the entire run, swiveling your head, looking for like who needs a smile and who needs a back slap, who mm -hmm. needs some water. And had spent 26 miles just focusing on somebody else. Then you, you're not going to run yourself into trouble. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That, that's, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I, I I, I love that you, you have all these unique perspectives of thinking about things. And, you know, mostly, like you said, it comes from other people's questions. So that's cool. OK, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor. And then I will be back with our final kick round. Depending on where you are in the world, summer or winter is coming. We only have a few precious weeks of this ideal running weather before the mental battles begin. Music or podcasts can make those long training days much easier, and I love to listen to 90s music to get me through the really tough parts. Jabra Pulse is the wireless sports earbud that was designed with runners in mind. Yes, that means no slipping out of your ear on those hot summer days, especially with the customizable in-ear pieces. It even has an accurate in-ear heart rate monitor, so you can use that to make sure those easy days stay easy. Yeah, just like you promised. I love mine, and I've run with musical podcasts more in these past few months than I have in the rest of my life combined. That is how great these are. Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. That's J-A-B-R-A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or buy the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra. 
this is where it starts. Okay, and for the final kick, and then I just want to ask you a few things about what you're up to. Uh, I'm going to get loose. Yeah, I know. Get loose. Okay, going to get ready for this. All right. right. This is going to be a big one. What is the greatest advice you've ever received? From Barefoot Ted. Okay. said, most people are always practicing pain. I don't practice pain. I practice pleasure. Oh. And his point is, you know, you go out for a run, people will drive themselves to the point where they're uncomfortable. And the next day they're stiff and they're sore. They don't want to come back again. Ted makes everything pleasurable. And so you always want to come back out and have some more exercise. I love that. I love that. And that actually matches along with uh, Mafetone as well, because you with his heart rate test and stuff, keeping to- it low. Yeah. Keep yourself below the point of distress. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, favorite running book? And I don't think I have to mention this, but you can't say your own. Uh, well, you know, um, off the top of my head, you know the one I love? Uh, have you read The Perfect Mile by Neil Bascom? No, I have not. Yeah, uh, I have a feeling there's another running book out there. It's not coming to my mind right now that I like more, but I always think about The Perfect Mile. It mm-hmm. was about, you know, the... Uh, the Roger Bannister rundown, like, you know, all the people competing around the world trying to, you know, hit this mark. So the perfect mile is fantastic. Okay, great. I will, I will definitely put a link to that in the show notes as well for people to check out. All yeah. right. What would be your advice to a new runner? I, I think, uh, forget time. Like when I run now, I never wear a watch. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I go by whim, go by whim, let, let whim be your guide. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you run, do you, is it just, you know, you, you go out and you say, oh, okay, I think I've had enough and then come back? Pretty much. Okay. I'll, I'll set off and I'll kind of look around like, hey, you know, where's the sun going up today? Okay, I think I'll run toward the sun and I'll head that direction and try to find the things which are, hey, you know, something's three o'clock, the school's up now, you know, I want to avoid the school buses, I'll go this way. So just try and make the run as physically pleasurable as you can when you start and then go from there. If you head now, it's a good day, let's, let's double it. It's mm-hmm. a crap day. Like today, today I, I, I literally walked out the door, but ah, it's cold and it's wet. I'm going to have a sauna mm-hmm. and just went inside instead. Yeah. I was just about to let everyone know that just in case you didn't say I was going <laughs> to yeah. tell them that you wimped out today because it wasn't total, sunny. Total wimp. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, what is your pre-race or pre-run meal? Something that you like? Yeah. You know, it's, um, I, I've eaten, I've been so much on uh, eggs Mm, me too. As a go-to for everything, yeah. So, um, I eat eggs like throughout the day. I would say some kind of egg product. You don't sure. eat them raw, though, do you? Nah, Ugh. nah. Yeah, we do. We just established ten seconds ago that I'm a wimp, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no Rocky Balboa for you, then. No, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm up a little. Um, I'll tell you one thing. I do is you buy these little cans of like Goya canned squid. You ever see these things like no. the Latino Latino supermarkets? <laughs> Cans, a canned squid omelet. Uh, oh, okay. I'm not sure how much I want to recommend this because... <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to try it. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually pretty good. I've been trying to get into sardines, and I think that's about as far as I'll go with the Yeah, with the no, not for me. I don't like sardines either, but the, the canned squid, pretty good. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe I'll have a look. I'll, I'll consider it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and your favorite running product? My favorite running product. You know what, man? I love uh, Barefoot Ted's Luna Sandals. Um, mm. It's a miracle to me that he created these things. And I wear them all the time. And I've never met anybody who got a pair of Ted's sandals that wasn't blown away by them. So, mm. yeah, I would say Ted's sandals. Okay, cool. Well, I will put a link to those in the show notes as well at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC110. Um, so then, yes, if you want to just share with us what, what's next, I mean, you've told us over the next few weeks, but is there a, another book in the works? Are you allowed to share that information or is there something oh, else man, long term? I'm, I'm happy to share. You're going to be sorry you asked. So <laughs> my, my new thing now has been um, we, we took in and we adopted this rescue donkey, this donkey that had uh-huh. been mistreated. And rather than having to stand around the backyard, I thought, I wonder if I could train this donkey to become a running partner huh. and go out. So they have these races in Colorado where you run next to your donkey. Uh, oh, it's wow. 20, 20, 29 miles, 22 miles, 15 miles. So since last summer, we've been training uh, Sherman as a running donkey, but then it's expanded. So my wife got one too. So she got her own mini Matilda. And then our neighbor, a friend of ours named Zeke got one too. So now the three of us are out there running with the donkeys uh, just about every day. So how does that work? Do you just go wherever you go, like with a, with them like tied to you or how, how does that logistically work? 
Yeah, so you have them. They have like a, a halter on their heads mm-hmm. and a rope clipped onto it. And what you train to do is to lead. So the, the goal is to, rather than pull the donkey, the donkey is in front of you. So you're, 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 it's called driving. So you're, you're learning to drive the donkey. Huh. And so that's what we've done. So now we'll go out and we're getting, we're getting at the point where it's actually we're pretty good. Uh, we can do a 10-mile run with the donkeys. Wow. And every once in a while, they'll like rebel. They'll say, F this. We're turning around. They'll turn around. you got to get them back going again. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun. And now it actually feels weird to go running without the donkeys. It feels like uh, this, isn't, this isn't right. Too lonely. <laughs> do you uh, know, yeah. I know this is, this is bad, but when you said about that, them being in front of you, I immediately had a, a vision of towards the end of a race and, you know, you've had enough and the, your donkey's just ahead of you, like dragging you along the floor, like you see in the, in the movies. That, yeah, and just, yeah. <laughs> that just came into my mind. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But, well, they're, they're old timers. They're old timers have got this system where when they go up a really steep hill, they can uh, loop the rope under their butts, and then the donkey will tow them up. So it's kind of oh, like, nice. like a ski lift. But <laughs> I, I haven't figured that one out yet for myself. <laughs> That's awesome. And how many people do those races? Do you know? I just like yeah, curious. yeah, about about fifty or sixty. Cool. Huh. Yeah, that be. Yeah. I will. I will look forward to those kind of photos when they when you when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice. It's nice being in a race field where you're not competing against thirty thousand. You're just competing against like forty nine other people. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. Well, awesome. And anything else? Should I dare I ask? Uh, yes, that's 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 it. I'm working on that, and and uh, that's gonna be my next book project. I'm looking at um, animal human partnerships. You know mm. how we used to partner with animals all the time. We've kind of lost that that skill and that relationship. So. Uh, this book will be about that. Looking at these races in particular, and then in general about. Uh, how we used to work with animals, and we don't do it so much anymore. So, what other animals would, what other animals did we kind of used to work? I mean, obviously, with uh, dogs are, you know, an obvious one. But what, what else? What other animals are there that we oh, used yeah, to work? When you think about what human life was like two hundred years ago, you, you rode horses, you milked cows, you had a hunting dog, you had a guard dog, you had cats to get mice, you had chickens in the backyard. Mm. Humans were around animals all the time. I see. When you walked off in the woods, you had to be aware of the animals around you. Otherwise, they'd be very aware of you. Mm. And again, it's only in the past 100 years, which is a very, very short span of human existence, that we've kind of shut that down. And, and we're sort of groping our way back. You know, you have service dogs and therapy dogs. And they find, like, when they bring cats into cancer wards, like, people respond better to their meds. Yeah. Why is that? Who knows? But there's some relationship we used to have with other species that we've kind of chopped off and, and now we're trying to reattach it. Hmm. And it's, that, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah. I can't wait to read that and hear more about that. Well, thank you for sharing. I appreciate yeah. um, you letting us see a glimpse into that. Well, I am going to wrap this up here. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And this has been fun. And, uh, you know, anyone listening, I would definitely encourage you to check out the show notes. We've got loads of good stuff for you today. And uh, thank you, Chris. Tina, that was, that was great. That was really fun. Thank you for humoring me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I had a blast talking to him. That was just so much fun, and he's just such a character, isn't he? So next week, we're going to be talking to the founder and president of Strava, Michael Hove. We get to hear the story behind Strava, some interesting stats that they have gathered together, and if you do not already use it, the chances are after this, you're probably going to want to. If you're a long-time listener, I would love if you would consider giving me a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate it, and you can find the details, as well as the show notes, at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc110. So until next time, have a great week.